fire. Amen. So, Jesus is in the wilderness, which means <laughs> this has to be the first Sunday in Lent. And I want to join him there for one last visit during my uh, tenure as your rector. And it's really great that it's in Mark. Uh, but first, I think it's important that we begin in Genesis with the uh, conclusion of the story of Noah. And that's because of the significance it has in the evolution of our understanding of God and, and how that informs uh, the way we are to treat with one another. Now, as was the case, and we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, as was the case with the uh, creation myths in Genesis, that first one. This is a story that is borrowed by the Jews from another culture. Its roots are deep in uh, Mesopotamia. And the original version, uh, I think, is part of the Gilgamesh epic. And it tells much the same story, although in that version, it is the god Enlil who seeks vengeance against humanity because their cities are too loud and he's having trouble sleeping. <laughs> Seriously. So since these humans are such a nuisance and obviously don't know their place, he figures they need to be wiped out. And all the other gods agree, almost. So Enlil sets to work orchestrating the storm of the century with the help of Adad, the god of storms. Nice title, the god of storms. And, well, you needed somebody back then before they came up with space lasers to wreak havoc with nature. But uh, anyway, uh, the hero of the story is uh, Utnapishtim, uh, who was warned in a dream by a rival god as to what Enlil is up to. And he's told that he should quickly convert his house into a boat and built to specific dimensions. It had seven decks, big boat. And then load his wife and children and other relatives and animals and supplies on board and then batten down the hatches. And so many details are similar, were kept you know, in the story of Noah, as the tale is retold by the Jews in Genesis, even down to the release of birds to see if the water has receded. As I hope I implied, this was a well-known tale, and since it appears in so many cultures and so many forms, it may even be a tale that sprang from a distant memory of a horrific flood of the Euphrates. And you know how memory the severity of wind and rain and the onslaught of water grow larger with time, as do the tales of heroes. But what makes the Genesis version so unique and in turn so important is the ending that they constructed, an ending they used to reveal something significant about their God. Now, like the God Enlil in the Gilgamesh epic, uh, in the Genesis version, Yahweh is also regretting the energy spent in birthing the human race. Their evil ways have given God, or so God thinks, no choice but to wipe them out and start over. Now, that wasn't the intent of Enlil, he just wanted them gone. Right? And similar to the Gilgamesh epic, Yahweh, not a rival God, uh, warns Noah, a rather upright fellow, that all this is going to happen and that he should build his ark to specific dimensions and then gather up his family and as many animals as he can, and of course, lots of supplies, and then batten down the hatches. And then, of course, the rains and floods come and everyone not in the ark is washed away. And as mentioned, Noah does the same dove and raven trick. And then when it is safe and he has decided the waters have receded, he and his family pour out of the ark. But then we get today's passage. Now, you know, we often talk about the notion of covenant and the ones we point to, uh, aside from our own baptismal covenant, are the covenants that God made with Abraham and then Isaac and Jacob and with Moses and the Israelites at Sinai and, and with David. But we forget that there was an earlier covenant, the original covenant, the one made with Noah and his descendants, and with all of the animals, of course. God thinks of everything. 
but it's the covenant in which God promises to never again use violence. In this instance, represented by the water, which is a most useful symbol in other places, but especially in the story of a flood, when it is a force that represents both destruction and rebirth and growth. After all, things need to be watered to grow. But the point is, by this story, we learn that the original covenant has to do with God renouncing violence. That it would never again be the way that God settled with human beings, or with animals, or with any part of creation for that matter. God would never again resort to violence, and the rainbow will always be the visible reminder of that as the story goes. And eventually, as we have discovered, that thought would continue to evolve such that the Jews came to understand that God, in fact, had never been the source of any violence. That it was a human invention, a response to the rivalry and competition and jealousy that accompanied the mindset of scarcity and was propelled by fear of the other who might take what I need to survive. I know we've talked about that a lot in the past year, and here it is again. But I wanted you to see that this revelation about God comes this early in the Jewish ordering of things, before Abraham, and before the story of Isaac and the prohibition against human sacrifice, before Isaac and Jacob and the promise of innumerable offspring, before Moses is given the commandments, before David is told that his descendants will reign forever, God makes a, pro a promise about violence that it never again will be a solution. And how easily we forget. We'll be coming back to all this on Passion Sunday. But this does bring us to Mark and to Jesus and his trip into the desert. You know, it's, it's striking, actually, that Mark's, Mark begins his gospel in this way. Uh, there's no backstory. Uh, there's nothing preordained. There are no genealogies. There's, there's no prophecy. There's no signs and portents, no proofs. All Mark is concerned about is the moment when Jesus suddenly appears among the crowd, gathered to hear John and be baptized by him. And he arrived at a chirotic moment, a moment of intense waiting and expectation. If you're familiar at all with the novel, The Last Temptation of Christ, its first chapter is much like the prologue to Moby Dick or A Tale of Two Cities. And it captures the unbearable tension and oppressive heaviness of the time when people with every breath are crying, how long, O Adonai, how long? People who were ready, who were dying for the arrival of a popular leader whom they could and would follow in a righteous revolt against the Roman occupiers and reclaim the holy city and drive the infidels from the temple. Now, men claiming to be the Messiah did appear, and Rome picked them off one by one. The roads and hillsides of Israel were filled with thousands of crosses holding the bodies of revolutionaries. And Mark probably got that much right in his storytelling. Jesus did his ministry in remote places, always on the move, teaching, training, exhorting, but always out of the reach of the empire and its puppets. Until that day, he deemed for the sake of the movement that he could stay away from Jerusalem no longer, even though he knew it meant certain death, and tried again and again to tell his followers how this road was going to end, but they could not hear it. But our focus is today's text and the beginning of that road. Jesus is baptized. In that moment, God sees him and claims him as son. And immediately, Mark says, immediately, the Spirit drives him out into the wilderness where he can be tested by Satan to see if he is worthy of that title, son. I sometimes wonder what would have happened if he failed. And again, I, I love the novel, The Last Temptation, because there's no mistaking who or what is meant by Satan in that novel's wilderness scene. If Satan is one who strives against God like the disciple Peter, 
And as Kazantzakis describes the wilderness, the temptations that confront Jesus come from within. His desire for power, for love, for fame, for the creature comforts and all the necessities of life. Can he set those desires aside? Can he say no to the systems of the world which will give him what he wants with a little wit and guile and courage? Can he say no to that? And can he say yes to God's agenda? Can he commit himself to living that authentic human life? Can he be that son of man? Free of all those things that degrade us, free of fear, free of hate, free of suspicion, free of violence. I also wonder sometimes if Jesus perhaps was not the first. And if he had failed that testing based on the evidence, would God have called another, presumably? But he was the one who was finally able to say yes, and then hold to that decision, to walk the road of obedience to love's command, to keep that original covenant, and all the others that followed, even if it meant his death. Did God see that in him when he came to the Jordan, when through the Spirit he told Jesus and Jesus alone, today you are my son. Forty days of testing. As we know, that's the numeric way of saying, as long as was necessary to complete the task. It might have been years. Still, Mark rushes through all of this in two sentences, because what really mattered to him was the year of ministry that followed. Jesus began a mission of proclaiming good news. He called disciples, he healed the sick, he taught. And then for all of that impertinence, he was hung on a cross to die by his enemies, a violent death to which he became a willing victim. But for Mark, as someone wrote, the meaning of Jesus resided in that brief sequence. Call, obedient response, lives touched, mounting opposition, the powerful threatened, a predictable death, and an empty tomb. So then to be a disciple in the eyes of Mark meant that a Christian entered into that same sequence, first by seeing what God did with Jesus, and then letting God do that to oneself. Jesus' call at the Jordan becomes our own call to step into the water, still a powerful symbol that contains both destruction and rebirth. Jesus' testing becomes our testing, our testing by all the powers of darkness, a testing that we know from our personal histories leads us into some less than flattering directions at times and more than we'd like to admit. We're at the beginning of Lent, and it's the last one we're going to spend together in our current relationship. And we are being invited once again to enter the wilderness, to enter a time of testing, to listen closely to the voices we hear out there and to discern carefully whether that voice is God's or our own. It is of vital importance to this parish, to this community, as we begin the search process, as we continue to unpack our housing mission and and further explore those other areas that contain so much promise and potential for us from renewing our commitment to racial reconciliation and the historical importance of of this building and the technological refit to this cherished brick church. It is important that we use this Lent to open our hearts and minds to what God through the Spirit is telling us, us, God's beloved sons and daughters. And I hope you heard that whispered at your baptism. Jesus went to his test with open heart and mind, and he saw what Satan was doing in promoting old and selfish ways, 
harmful ways, destructive ways. And he made a decision out there. He remained true to God who was always moving forward, always saying new things, never allowing grace to be paralyzed by lesser trivial concerns. And he clung to God rather than to the whims and wishes of his own heart. Over the next 40 days, may we be of that same heart and mind and see where that leads us down that road. Amen. In